commercially have a control algorithm called PID to provide low level control. Now, PID has a number of limitations. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about our progression towards the next generation of flight control systems. So this is actually an excellent setting for uh, me telling you about this work because this video was taken three years ago here in Hurriery, in which a group of us at BU were introduced to first person view drone racing, including Will that's here, Ethan, Craig and I. And first person view or FPV drone racing, you wear goggles that get a live stream of the uh, onboard camera, so you get this full immersed flying experience. And we would meet together and talk about the technologies involved in these drones and uh, figuring out how to fly uh, with these little teeny dinky drones that had horrible performance at the time. And things kind of just escalated from this point. Uh, my office quickly became the storage area for all of our gates. We started getting more serious into uh, actual racing. And uh, there wasn't much of a community in Boston. So in 2017, I founded Boston Drone Racing. And we currently have over 100 members. Rob here is representing BDR. And we would meet to work on drone-related projects and uh, do races and other, uh, other events. It came very clear early on that this was starting to consume my life, and I had to somehow figure out how to start integrating this into my research. So as Azar said, I flipped on him. We were doing years of research in cybersecurity, and I took a very drastic turn into seeing how we could actually improve the control systems of these uh, type of aircraft. So we started looking at the trends going on in this space for uh, flight control. And the research was really saturated in autopilots and autonomous flight. Uh, for example, performing waypoint navigation, how to navigate spaces, and ob uh, obstacle avoidance. Now, in the future, these are amazing technologies that are going to be very useful. However, for these to be adopted in the real world, we're always going to need some sort of like manual override. And also, there wasn't much work being done to progress the low level uh, flight control of the aircraft, which I mean of how do you actually uh, control the signals to the motor to make it perform the maneuvers you want to. And I'll go with, uh, into the details of that in a second. So this was an awesome opportunity for someone like me that is involved in like manually piloting the actual aircraft. And we saw an opportunity here that we, we took. So what do I mean by this low level flight control? Well, this is also called attitude control. And attitude is really just the orientation of an object in space. So attitude control, we use uh, our control algorithms to control the angular velocity of the aircraft so that we can obtain some desired orientation of that aircraft. And this diagram here is uh, a very simple example of what the flight control system on the drone the flight control task would look on the drone. We have some flight control algorithm that's gonna take input from our IMU, our inertia measurement unit, that has a gyroscope. This is typical, don't, don't mind that. Uh, so this gyro, we can obtain the actual angular velocity of the aircraft from the sensor. And then we also want to achieve some desired angular velocity. There's some set point that we want the aircraft to actually reach. And this set point, if we're manually piloting the aircraft, might come from our remote control. Or we can think of this entire flight control task as a lower level control loop in which maybe a higher level, more intelligent control loop, such as an autopilot, might be actually providing these set points here. Now, these two desired and actual angular velocities are fed into a flight control algorithm. And this flight control algorithm actually determines what the control signals, meaning approximately what is the power that should be distributed to each one of these motors, should be sent to the electronic speed controller. So what this means is we have a control signal which contains the approximate value for each power going to each motor, and the electronic speed controller is a separate independent piece of uh, electronics that will actually determine what is the amount of voltage or power to apply to each of the motors. So this control algorithm, we want to figure out what this control signal is going to be. Yes. Yep. Why is the set point the desired angular velocity rather than the desired angle? Uh. <laughs> well, we can control the actual angular velocity to get to that desired angle. So you could think of this uh, 
as bad as being a higher control loop in which, and this is what the autopilot will do. It will say, okay, well, I actually want to uh, get to a 40 to 5 degree angle, right, to maintain some heading. So this control algorithm will then say, okay, well, we are going to approach that uh, angle at this certain velocity, and then when we reach that set point or that particular orientation, then we'll stop the, this in the control loop. So it's just one method to be able to get to that desired orientation. Right, exactly. Okay, so future control algorithms uh, for attitude control in particular will be able to provide the ability to learn, plan, and adapt. For example, they will be able to learn what the actual flight envelope is, the air, what the aircraft has to be able to identify what the current capabilities of the aircraft are. They'll be able to plan and forecast in the future any sort of system failures and mitigate those from actually occurring before they do to uh, reach unprecedented levels of safety and reliability. They'll be able to adapt to the very complex dynamics that will be exposed, such as the discharging and nonlinear discharging dynamics of a battery and also shifts in payload. So what we really need here are uh, high order executive functions, similar to what our actual brain can produce. Now, luckily, there is a mathematical model that's able to uh, model these high order executive functions that we desire. And that is by an artificial neural network. And an artificial neural network has a very nice property based on the universal approximation theorem that says, as long as we have a certain number of these neurons or node in this a model, we can approximate any continuous function. Now that's a very powerful statement there. So we're, we can theoretically obtain all these high order goals that we just described. The challenge is for each one of these connections or these weights that connect all these neurons together, we have to develop ways to train or actually teach this entire graph how to obtain the desired uh, performance of, say, a flight controller that we want to achieve. Now, uh, being able to have these futuristic low-level attitude controllers to be able to do these very advanced control goals will be amazing. However, just to scope my thesis and what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk, First, before we can do any of this, we need to take a step back and we need to be able to use these basic elements of what the neural network can provide. And we just need to first make sure that these neural networks can provide stable, accurate flight control. After we have this foundation, we can then start building on top of this these much more incredible uh, advanced control goals. So how do we actually go about training these neural networks? Well. Up until very recently, this was considered a very hard problem to be able to train these neural networks, uh, continuous control tasks such as flight control. And it wasn't until recently that we had huge advancements in deep reinforcement learning, uh, which we were able to start uh, solving some of these problems. When I say deep here, what I'm referring to is that uh, this neural network that we're trying to train has two or more of these hidden layers or hidden, hidden nodes. So it's just the size of the network. Now in deep reinforcement learning or uh, reinforcement learning, we have an agent, which in our case is gonna be this neural network, and it's going to try to learn a task interacting with an environment. It's gonna provide an action that's gonna modify this environment in some way. And in return, the environment is gonna return back its current state S and also a reward indicating how well this action actually was at achieving this like task at hand. Now, this interaction back and forth will occur millions and millions of times. So this environment and this entire system here is run in a computer simulation. So we can run it at faster in real time and actually have this like practical. So the goal of this reinforcement learning algorithm is to maximize the rewards over time to learn this task optimally. Okay, um, so you can think of reinforcement learning as you're trying to reinforce good behavior. Such, for example, if you're trying to teach your dog a new trick, you keep reinforcing the good behavior with the treat. 
So there are two challenges if we're going to try to use reinforcement learning for uh, training these neural networks for low-level attitude control. The first is accuracy, and that was providing our baseline. Is it possible and can we provide these training algorithms to be able to reach the desired angular velocity that we want to of this aircraft? So what I mean is uh, before we had those two inputs to the control algorithm, the set point, so we want to reach some desired state we want our aircraft to maybe roll at 300 degrees per second. And then, depending on the control algorithm's control signals to actually control all the motors, it's going to achieve some other angular velocity. That's going to be the actual angular velocity. And ideally, we want this uh, actual angular velocity to match the desired state as close as possible. And this defines our error, just the difference between the two. The second challenge that we address is transferability. Now, because this interaction is in a computer simulation, we have this performance gap that we're expected to see in which the simulation world is going to have unmodeled dynamics that differ from the real world. The real world is a very complex place, so being able to actually model all of these in simulation is going to be impractical. So we assume that when we're training in the simulation world, it's going to be challenging to actually jump from one world to the other. Now, this performance gap is commonly referred to in literature as the reality gap. And ideally, we want to reduce or eliminate this actual gap so we can provide seamless uh, transferability from one world to the other. So now for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be uh, describing our approaches to solving these two challenges with our solution stack in which we develop to create these type of flight control systems. First, I'm going to introduce our training environment called GMFC in which we can use to synthesize and create these neural networks that are trained attitude control. Then, in order to actually use this neural network in the real world and validate its performance, we create the world's first neural network supported flight control firmware called NeuroFlight. Then I'm going to be discussing to you our process in which we create a digital replica of our real aircraft, otherwise known as a digital twin, and how we can reduce the reality gap and increase accuracy by actually synthesizing our neural network controller exactly for the aircraft that we're ultimately going to be flying in the real world. First, we're going to be talking about GMFC, its architecture, and our uh, initial feasibility analysis that we performed to see if these are even, this is even a possibility. I'm going to first walk through our architecture. And this architecture is on its third revision now, and this is the most recent one. Right now, GMFC, uh, from feedback from the community, is actually a universal flight control uh, tuning software. So not only can we use it to develop these neural flight controllers, but also tune traditional control algorithms as well. And GMFC is comprised of uh, uh, two modules, a simulation environment and a simulation controller. This simulation controller is a Python library allowing um, other developers to actually interact with it, while the simulation environment is in this entire ecosystem of a high fidelity physics simulator called Gazebo. Now, in order to interact and manipulate the actual simulation world, we develop a plugin that is within this ecosystem. And then uh, we provide an interface of uh, running a UDP server in here, uh, allowing the simulation controller to actually interact with it. Now, to provide this flexibility, the newest version of GMFC requires three user modules to be provided. This increases flexibility and allows all these different modules, modules to be inter-swapped to allow developers to experiment with different uh, flight control algorithms and different uh, aircraft. So the first user module is an actual digital twin or an aircraft model for what you actually are trying to tune this flight controller for. And this digital twin uh, requires a mo uh, motor plugin to be able to model the dynamics of the motor. And also, also the IMU plugin there and the inertia measurement unit, which we can obtain the actual angular velocity of the aircraft. We also have a GMFC plugin in this digital twin, and just, this just provides configuration information so it can be loaded in. Now, uh, the new version is actually pretty cool because as soon as GMFC starts, this, is, this digital twin is totally decoupled from the architecture, so it's dynamically loaded into the world as soon as it starts. 
And our unique training environment allows us to train these aptitude or low level controllers independent or navigation or guidance tasks by fixing the aircraft when it's loaded into the environment about its center of thrust. That way it's able to, uh, it's able to rotate in any direction without, um, uh, which is otherwise impossible to do in the real world due to gimbal lock and also friction. So uh, it being fixed in the world, we're now able to uh, teach it just the specific task. The next uh, user provided module is the environment interface. And this entire, these three components right here consist of the environment that I previously showed you. So we have the agent, and the agent is the reinforcement learning algorithm of the neural network, and it's going to be making these interactions, except it's obviously like the environment is much more complicated than that. Now, the environment interface here is uh, implements the API provided by OpenAI Jim. And OpenAI is a nonprofit organization that was founded by Elon Musk and has been progressing the field of reinforcement learning. And what OpenAI Gym API does is it standardizes the actual interface for these environments, allowing anyone to develop their own environment. And as long as you implement this uh, common API, then you can swap out these reinforcement learning algorithms how you want. And it just simplifies the entire process of everything. And you just fit into this entire ecosystem. Now, the neural network that we have here, all of this is happening in a computer and is ha happening offline. It's being trained, right? The only thing that we're actually going to take out of here and transfer onto the real drone is this trained neural network. That's it. Everything else is just in a computer simulation. So now I'm going to walk through the steps which we take to complete one simulation step. So first, as we saw in the previous diagram of reinforcement learning, the neural network is going to provide some action in this environment. And this is going to be um, given as input to the step uh, function provided by the OpenAI Gym API. Now, the step function is going to convert this action to the actual control signals uh, to provide to the actual aircraft. And these might be different because a neural network usually has a different range uh, than what a a control signal for an aircraft would be. So it just provides this translation, and we now get our control signal U. We're now uh, interfacing with the simulation controller at this point. And this interface, we can kind of think of the aircraft interface. The control signal sent here and in the environment interface, it should not be able to distinguish between the simulation world and the actual real world on the quadcopter. Be Providing this type of architecture, we can have seamless uh, transferability from the simulation world to the actual quadcopter itself. Now, the, simula uh, the simulation controller, because these are in, um, because we're in the gazebo ecosystem here, and this is in Python, all of the orange arrows you see are going to actually be network packets. So we take the control signal and we send a network packet of the actual control signals into gazebo, uh, into the gazebo ecosystem. Now, one of the challenges we had was how do we keep this nice decoupled architecture for this digital twin, but still allow us to communicate with this digital twin? Well, we ended up using a uh, publish subscribe type communication channel in which the values for the actual motors and control signals are published. And we also subscribe to all the supported sensors that would be uh, emulated by that actual aircraft. So what I mean by this is, in order to send these, this control packet to propagate it, we publish these values to a topic in the air. Uh, and this has just a string defined by aircraft command. Now, anybody that subscribes to this topic will be able to obtain that control signal. So whoever is developing and creating this digital twin, it's up to the implementer to make sure that they actually use our API and they're actually subscribing to this topic. Otherwise, none of the motors are actually going to spin in their, their digital twin. And then the reverse process has to happen. So any sensors they have on board this aircraft, they need to make sure that they're actually publishing their values. And then our plugin makes sure that uh, before this time step ends, we're just subscribing to all these and we block until we receive all these values. We combine all these values into a single packet and then we turn the control back over to the simulation controller. We then propagate it 
back to the uh, environment interface, state represented by S. And then the other big thing that the environment interface has to do, if you recall from the reinforcement library diagram, is it has to determine what the next state is, which ultimately will be used as input to the neural network, and we have to define some reward. Now, at the beginning of this simulation, we have to define what our desired set point or desired angular velocity the aircraft needs to reach. So the environment interface will define this and then take that into consideration when actually computing the actual reward that's going to be sent back. And we're going to go into the details and implementation of this later on in the talk. Okay, I'm not going to go too deep into, yeah, Tommy. Yeah. Doing which part? How doing this on the aircraft? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so like, I'm not interested in that because uh, I would do it a different way, right? So like, I think what you're getting at is how do we um, go about putting this on board so we can do this in real time, like dynamically, but there are far more efficient like methods. Uh, this is in the field of online learning to be able to do this because the the amount of computation you need to put all this on board uh, I mean we're running it on a, a decent desktop computer in the basement and like it still kind of struggles so yeah um, there are more optimized approaches to do this online right right that's right so that's the end for yeah uh, future work so I'm not going to go into the total details given time for our feasibility analysis, but um, what we ended up wanting to first do when we're thinking of the actual reinforcement learning agent, of these uh, current state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms, do we currently even have the ability to build these accurate controllers? This was totally unknown and kind of a risk for us, which I don't know if Azar particularly was fond of. Uh, this was totally unknown at the time. Um, so we used, uh, for simplicity, a aircraft model based on the iris quadcopter that's provided by Gazebo, so we didn't have to create that ourselves. And then what we would uh, do in the environment interface is just randomly sample from a uniform distribution what the angular velocity or the desired angular velocity should be of that aircraft at the beginning, and then we gave that agent one second to try to reach that, so we could then look at what the step response was of the aircraft. And the state we returned back was the air, so the air between the set point and the actual angular velocity for each of the three axes. And then also the angular velocity of each one of the rotors. That's what we would send back as the state and would be used as input to the actual neural network. And then the reward here is just trying to minimize the air. So we're penalizing based on the air, so then the, the reinforcement learning algorithm just tries to minimize that reward, so we reduce the air. So we take the difference between the actual and the desired, take the absolute value of that, sum that, and then just normalize it um, for each axis, and then the max, which was 300 degrees per second. So for our procedure, uh, there are three uh, state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms provided by the OpenAI Baselines uh, implementation project that uh, have been known in past literature to provide uh, good performance for continuous control tasks. So we chose to test proximal uh, policy optimization, trust region policy optimization, and deep deterministic uh, policy gradient. We trained each one of these for 10 million time steps, these interactions with the environment. And we also compared the performance to uh, the traditional PID controller using the Ziegler and Nicholas method. Now, as a summary of, like, just to take away from this feasibility analysis, uh, the PPO algorithm out, way outperformed every other algorithm we tested, even PID. And uh, in overall error, it actually had a 44% decrease in error compared uh, to the PID algorithm. This is just a sample of one of the uh, simulation experiments that we ran that happens in validation after training. And we have PPO in orange here, and you can see by the dashed line, which indicates the actual desired set point or actual desired angular velocity we want to reach here. And the orange line is the actual angular velocity that the uh, quadcopter in the simulation was able to achieve. So we can see uh, 
here that it is able to reach the desired set point in every single one of the axes quite well, where the other two reinforcement learning algorithms had severe oscillations that would make them completely um, unstable in the real world. Uh, PID has uh, overall pretty great performance. However, it does suffer from overshoot because we are testing a pretty wide flight envelope. And um, overall, uh, PID had a, a longer rise time, so the delay of getting up to the set point was, was less. We tested a, a, a variety of other metrics, but just to get the general idea of the performance, yeah, no. Yep. Yes, you could, but when you are tuning a PID controller, you're tuning it for a specific flight envelope, and we're actually trying to stress the controllers as much as possible. And I actually have a slide if we have more time at the end. We actually do a thorough comparison of the flight envelopes and show neural network-based controllers have a larger flight envelope than PID controllers. Yeah. Ah, okay, so a flight envelope, there are so many definitions of it, but just think of it as a stability region in which the aircraft can operate in. Yeah. So there are multiple different ways depending on fixed wing and like multi-rotor on how to define this. But um, in this context, you can just think of it as uh, in terms of angular velocity, how uh, and what range can we actually still have stable performance? So now that we were like super excited from these results that, all right, uh, this is this could be the real deal. We have some, <laughs> yeah, yeah, risk. <laughs> Um, we can actually uh, now start to see if we can get similar behavior in the real world and start seeing like what sort of reality gap that we actually have. Like, and yeah. Control algorithms. There are a lot of linear uh, feedback linearization. There's a huge field of traditional control. Uh, the reason why we are mainly comparing to PID is because uh, of the open source and openness of these like algorithms that are readily available, and also because this is the only one that's actually used in commercial flight control firmwares. But um, when when it comes to real firmware, there are. Uh, the most advanced uh, PID implementation that I've seen uses something called gain scheduling. So uh, PID control has static gains, typically. Now, a, back in like the 1960s, when fixed wing aircraft were getting uh, super advanced supersonic speeds, they were facing the same problems. How do we expand the flight envelope, even though we have these fixed gains? And the next thing was performing uh, gain scheduling, which then increased or changed the gains depending on certain operating regions. And this implementation is in the current high performance flight control firmware beta flight, in which on certain conditions, it will change those gains. But that's the most adaptive that's kind of current commercially available. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we did. I did that in the thesis, actually. Yeah. So, um, in later work, I was like, "All right, does it even make sense to be sampling from uh, a random uniform distribution? Why don't we actually take all this data provided by Rob and Will and uh, myself and actually form these distributions to see what does what kind of commands are we actually giving as like set points? It's." Uh, it's not uh, Gaussian, it's not uniform. I don't know what it is. Uh, it's, it's very, uh, the probability of being just at center is extremely high and then it really tapers off. Um, and actually, that's what we do at the very end, so we change that up. Yeah. How uh, did that work? How did Oh yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> Okay, so now we want to evaluate this actual uh, controller in the real world. So we created the world's first neural network supported flight control firmware. I'll be discussing the actual firmware details and also its tool chain in which we can take this trained neural network and actually compile it to fly on the actual drone. Okay, now to provide an overview. Here is the, a diagram of what the high-performance flight control firmware beta flight roughly looks like. 
beta flight is what the majority, if not all of our, us are using for racing. Everybody using it? Okay, yeah, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> everybody. Now, this flight control task, we have still our, um, our gyro, which we get the actual angular velocity, and our RC command from our controller. We're getting our, our set points that we want uh, the aircraft to reach. And our control algorithm is PID. Now, we have to have a PID controller to control each of the axes of rotation, so we actually have three PID controllers in here. And the output of the PID controller goes to what's called a mixer. And what the mixer does is it collectively takes all the outputs from the PID controller, and then it applies some logic that takes into consideration the geometry of the frame. And the reason why we need to do this is if you think of where the motor is positioned on the quadcopter in relation to the uh, axis of rotation, think of it as a lever. So uh, the torque changes depending on how far away the motor is from that axis of rotation. And the mixer takes all that into consideration. Now, what we did for NeuroFlight is we ripped out the PID controller, we ripped out the actual mixer code, and we provided an interface so we could drop in our trained neural network and then we also add in a throttle, mixel, uh, throttle mixer, which should not be confused with the previous mixer. The previous mixer, which is taking into consideration the geometry of the frame, the neural network is actually learning this and encoding it into itself during training, which has a nice property, so it condenses the two. Throttle mixing is needing, needed is because if you recall, in the simulation environment, the aircraft is fixed about its center of thrust meaning it's, it's fixed there. It can rotate however it wants, but it has no concept of translational movements. So when you move this into the real world where you're not fixed about the center of thrust, the only way to move in the X, Y, or Z direction is to first rotate in that orientation, apply thrust, and then you can now move in these directions. So throttle mixing allows us to provide these directions in the X, Y, and Z direction. Now, how does this logic uh, actually work? How do we implement this? Well, first thing is first, is the logic is no matter what, you always prioritize achieving that angular velocity. If you have additional uh, room in the actual output of the control signals, we can mix in additional throttle. But I want to make it very clear that zero throttle does not mean the propellers are not spinning. In other flight control firmwares, this is referred to as error mode, where if we're in a free fall and our throttle is zero, we still have full control over the aircraft. And it allows us to do the type of aerobatic maneuvers and advanced um, precision flight that uh, you see in things like drone racing and things like that. So if, you, um, if our neural network outputs uh, these values, which roughly correspond to the percent power that is going to be delivered to each one of the motors to achieve that angular velocity, we first find the max value. And whatever this available range is, we are going to scale it by whatever throttle value we actually are applying, or what our desired throttle is. So if this is about 50% of the avail available range that we have, we take 50% of that as well. And then this is applied proportionally to every single one of the motors. It has to be proportional because if not, then it's going to end up affecting the actual desired angular velocity. So then this becomes the actual control signal that we send to the electronic speed controller, and then this power is distributed to all the motors. Uh, next I'll be discussing, once we actually have this, uh, this source code that we developed, we have the neural network, how do we compile this into something we can actually put on the drone? Well, we start off uh, with our digital twin, and the entire first um, part of this talk in which we are discussing uh, GMFC, which in the first stage, we're just synthesizing or creating this actual neural network. It's going to be interacting with some RL framework, and as long as the RL framework supports something known as a TensorFlow checkpoint, TensorFlow is just a, um, a framework for uh, creating neural networks and machine learning. As long as this able, is able to output a checkpoint, um, then it can be used in our tool chain. Now, what this checkpoint actually consists of is an entire description of the actual neural network and also the operations for, perfor for performing uh, training. So in our optimization stage, we have to take this entire checkpoint graph 
And the first thing we need to do is just some uh, bookkeeping and we uh, take all the variables that exist, we convert those to constants. And then the more important stage is transformation in which we have all this stuff going on in the graph, but all we're interested in is that neural network that we just trained. So this actually or extracts the subgraph in this huge graph of just that trained neural network. And that is passed to another TensorFlow tool called TF Compile, which can take that TensorFlow graph, convert that into a object file and its corresponding C header file, which we can then use to link into the rest of our neural flight source code. Now, this wasn't quite that easy because Betaflight and, of course, NeuroFlight um, requires us to use uh, hard coding point arithmetic. So we actually had to modify TF compile because it doesn't support arbitrary compilation flags. And we just had to make sure that these were all compatible once, um, once these two were built to be able to link together. And they all have to be the same. So then the output using the ARM tool chain is our actual NeuroFlight firmware. We could take this and now we can flash it to the microcontroller uh, on our aircraft and we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, now the last thing I'm gonna be discussing is the actual digital twin development. So up until this point, we were using various different aircraft uh, models to be able to test our stuff and uh, doing, uh, the, doing the creation of this digital twin is quite time consuming and expensive. Thank you, Renato. And uh, this was quite a process, which I'll be going through now. This is the, uh, the racing drone that I, the custom racing drone I built for this project, uh, which I call NF1, NeuroFlight 1. And our goal is to be able to create a digital replica of this so that it can be used in simulation so it can uniquely synthesize this neurocontroller to control this drone. There are multiple steps involved in actually creating this digital replica. Uh, the first is actually creating the static components. So we need to use 3D modeling software to actually design all these parts. Uh, we need to identify and figure out all the um, geometric and mass properties such as inertia, and, uh, center of mass. Um, then we need to model all the dynamic components. So how do we emulate the actual IMU? How do we uh, actually model the motors? And given our time constraints, I'm only gonna be talking about motor modeling because it's the most interesting. Um, there's nothing really exciting about the rigid body creation. The IMU, all we do is we sample from the real gyroscope and uh, fit that to a Gaussian distribution and then inject that as noise during training. Okay, so uh, summarizing how we actually create the motor, uh, the motor model, well, we, base all of our motor models off of the already established PX4 uh, software in the loop motor models. Uh, and then we make custom enhancements because through our research we actually found that there were quite some inaccuracies or improvements that could actually be made, particularly for the motor response. So how do we model the motor response? Well first we need to identify a polynomial transfer function that actually maps what our uh, desired control signal is to what corresponding RPM of the motor that's actually going to be. And then we use a PID controller for actually modeling the response or the delay that this actual motor will have in the real world. And then for the torque and thrust outputs, we were, uh, we were using pretty much the PX4 um, uh, motor plugins pretty, uh, pretty to the point in which we need to identify the coefficient of torque and the coefficient of thrust. Now these coefficients can be obtained from uh, measuring actual uh, motor uh, characteristics, in which the coefficient of torque here, Q is the actual torque output from the motor, rho is the air density, N is the revolutions per second, and D is the diameter of the prop. And then the coefficient of thrust, T is the thrust, all of the others are the same. Now, in order to derive all of these models, we need to, um, we need to be able to measure these responses and also uh, apply step and ramp control inputs to the motor to see how it behaves. In order to be able to do this, we had to uh, develop a dimometer. Say that three times fast, I, I, I can't. Um, and uh, this is ultimately the uh, dyno for shorts, okay, that we ended up creating. Now, uh, what this entails is we have a static um, 
thrust stand in which you have our motor and propeller that we're actually testing mounted uh, perpendicular to the ground. And this is attached in perpendicular to two load sensors, and this, these, this is going to allow us to measure torque. And then parallel to the actual motor, we have another load sensor to measure force or the thrust output. These are all connected uh, to amplifiers and then connected to an Arduino in which we uh, send all this data back over a serial connection to our PC. Now, the PC is running our dyno software, and we also have another module that is generating the control inputs to the motor uh, to provide these step and these uh, ramp control inputs so we can see the response. Now, the unique thing about our actual dyno here is we're repurposing the actual electronics of the drone that is not only cost effective, but allows us to get some additional uh, of the dynamic uh, characteristics of, say, the actual battery or the electronic speed controller that we're uh, reusing um, in our actual measurement. So, you know, that's nice. Uh, so we have a API in which we're able to interact with the actual um, uh, flight control firmware. It sends the actual power to the motor, and this will spin. Now, in order to measure the RPMs or the velocity of the, the rotor, we use a phototransistor connected to the oscilloscope, and then when we apply a light source to the phototransistor, every single time the blade passes, it generates a pulse in the oscilloscope. And then we can then um, use a script to be able to parse out what the actual RPMs is from that. This system used to be all fully automated until Renato actually <laughs> found out that it, it, I'm gonna actually tell this real quick, because this is, this is hilarious. We found out the simulation data wasn't matching with the actual capture data, and we we're trying to figure out why, and it turns out that at, because our motor RPM is so fast, uh, when the RPMs get to a certain point, the light that's actually being passed through the blade starts to minimize, which causes the voltage levels in the oscilloscope to drop below the threshold of what is considered a digital high on the Arduino. So we, able, we were able to fix this by uh, using the oscilloscope, which, which is much more precise, but excellent catch. So this is what the actual uh, dyno built looks like. Um, where we have the static thrust stand right here. You can see NF1 in the background and uh, the rest of the Arduino and all the shows that they're here is performing an actual uh, ramp right now of uh, control exposure. And this is actually kind of here right, uh, right at it. But behind the right there, so it's <laughs> Okay. Um, now, quickly, just to show the flexibility of... Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, uh, so are you talking about like the advance ratios and stuff like that in like a wind tunnel? Because it is under pressure, yeah. it's not physically moving in the air, you get different dynamic effects and colors. Yeah, you, uh, absolutely. So like what we can do is actually use the coefficient of torque and thrust. And um, we can, these change depending on the advance ratio, and that depends on what is the actual um, forces applied to the, uh, the actual propeller propulsion system, which is usually done in a wind tunnel, depending on what the velocity is coming at. And that's going to add, when you look at the actual benchmarking in the uh, aerospace literature, it's always based on doing multiple different advance ratios. But for basing off of everything off the PX4 uh, motor models, they just use the advance ratio as zero, which is just means it's at the static state. Yeah, but uh, there are I, uh, I I found many inaccuracies when it comes to actually using these models. So there's so much room for improvement for adding these additional dynamics. Ah, yes, yeah, uh, good question. Um, so we are going um, towards the actual uh, thrust. We uh, do you mean, well are in the real world. We can't uh, go in reverse direction with this DSC, but. Um, there are ESCs that do support reverse directions. That's just not something our aircraft supports. Um, you need, uh, um, at least in Betaflight, does support being able to have, I think, 3D mode in which you can actually go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we did. Uh, we did test the um, uh, the deceleration. If that's what you mean, I'll show. You. Okay. We can. Um, well, in order to compare the real world with the actual simulation world, we just use GMFC in order to create an actual virtual dyno. So then we can compare the two and see how accurate everything is. 
so for our first experiment, we have the actual motor response results. And what we did is we actually chose um, four different uh, percent throttle values to apply to the actual motor, 25%, 50, 75, and 100. And we would set those high for one second, and then we would set that back to uh, zero so that we could measure the acceleration of the motor and then also the deceleration. And the solid line indicates our actual measured. And then what we did is we took our PID controller that's actually being used in um, the motor model to be able to model what the actual response is. And the dashed line here, what we would do is we keep incrementing the actual P gain uh, for the PID controller until we got to this value of 0001. And uh, we were able to um, get pretty uh, good estimation of a less than 5% error we can uh, compare them to. And our motor is able to output uh, more than 25,000 RPMs of speed fast. One thing that we ended up uh, identifying that isn't modeled in the PX4 motor models is that uh, the actual throttle curve for the comparison between the control input and the RPM is, is not linear. Uh, this dashed red line is actually a linear reference of what the PX4 motor models assume is actually happening, where uh, this orange line is the actual throttle curve of our motor. And this, uh, when we do a polynomial fit to this data, we get this polynomial function right here, two degree polynomial. And this becomes our transfer function that we use when the output of the neural network has a control signal. We perform this mapping to get what the actual desired RPM of that motor should be. Uh, now I'll go over the torque and thrust measurements. Um, we performed on the dyno a ramp up to 100% throttle for 20 seconds, and then we performed a deceleration um, for another 20 seconds. Now that we have, we, you have to do these uh, steps in order, so you have to model the motor response first, and then that just means in simulation the motor can spin up, but you still need to model then the actual torque and thrust output of that motor. So this step has to be done next. And um, we, after you're able to derive uh, from the actual real data the coefficient of torque and the coefficient of thrust, then we can finish the, the model. With the finished model, then we can run that back in the dyno and we can get what our actual uh, simulated performance is. Now there is a shift, um, and we have the actual mean absolute error here. This uh, primarily is due to um, when you actually look at the plot of the um, coefficient of torque and coefficient of thrust, which is a function of the actual velocity of the rotor, this isn't linear either. So although the models and just in general the uh, coefficient of torque and thrust are represented by one value, this is dependent also on the velocity. So in the future, to improve these type of models, we can definitely do uh, much more um, sophisticated like modeling methods to be able to improve this. Okay, now uh, that we have these motor models, we need to look at kind of bringing everything like <coughs> full circle. Now I'm going to discuss the actual environment interface we're using uh, uh, for training. And this is like, I can't even tell you how many iterations it's taken to actually get to this point, but as you'll see, this is a very good one. Um, so what we do in the simulation environment, we perform three stages, essentially, what is happening is we're, per, uh, we're giving the agent a set point that resembles a pulse. And this allows us to teach really like the agent three things. In the first stage here, we're teaching it to be able to how, uh, maintain a specific um, initial uh, zero degree uh, angular velocity. And also teaching it how to ramp up to a desired set point. The second stage al allows us to teach the agent to maintain that desired step point for a certain amount of time. And then the third stage is you should be able to actually um, decelerate and then go back to a resting position. Now, this set point that we select here, going back, I think, Tommy, you just said this, this is being sampled now from a Gaussian distribution where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is 100 degrees per second. Because from our experimental results, we found this is actually more accurate all right, taking a step back, the main motivation for using a Gaussian distribution to sample from here is we found during training, the actual range you're selecting, you're sampling from, the agent is actually gonna be a lot more accurate within that range. So if you're sampling from 
a very large range. It's going to be pretty accurate throughout it, but it's very rarely looking at the distributions from the actual pilot commands that you're on the extremes of these, uh, these bounds, right? So ideally, we want to be the most accurate in the set points that are most common, but still have um, a good performance throughout as much as possible. Now, the state that we provide as input to the actual neural network is the actual error, but also the delta or the change in the error. And this is a change from previous versions in which we had the engine velocity of the motor because that relies on us being able to get the actual velocity of the rotor, which from YouTubers I've been talking to uh, <laughs> this week, I guess Betaflight has recently changed in which not only do they have their original ESC telemetry, which you can obtain like the temperature and the RPMs, the rate at which that happened was very slow. But I've been told now that improvements to the new telemetry allows us to happen at 1K hertz, which now puts it into a realistic um, ability to actually see um, Is he playing by himself? OK. Um, the last thing that uh, I'm going to discuss is the reward that is critical for actually uh, making an accurate controller. This is a lot of math, so I'm going to summarize what it, it means. But Essentially, uh, the first thing that we have to do is provide a reward to minimize the error, because that's what ultimately uh, will result in an accurate and precise controller. Uh, we found, though, that in, from uh, past policies that we've trained, it was actually more stable to provide the change in this actual error reward than actually just penalizing based on the error, like we did in, the, in our first feasibility. So this. That, actually providing the change in this error provides more stable updates. And I actually noticed that this is how some of the open AI baseline projects were already doing things. Um, the next thing we want to do is we want to penalize the agent on uh, its actual control signals that it's generating to try to minimize the oscillations or minimize the actual control output. So here we're just taking the difference between the current uh, control output and what the previous one was, taking the absolute value, taking the max of that, and scaling it by a positive value to kind of balance all the rewards out. Uh, the third is actually a positive reward that is um, going to minimize the output, control output, as long as it's in some threshold or error band. So we reward, if you're already in the error band, that's good. And the more you can reduce your power outputs, even better. Now, the reason for this is in our uh, training environment, again, remember that it's fixed about its center of thrust, which means that if we're providing a uh, desired set point of zero degrees uh, per second, that can be applied in infinite number of ways as long as the proportion to every single motor is the same. So that means that uh, a control signal of zero will provide the same exact uh, output as a control signal of one, which would be 100% throttle. So this is extremely scary finding this out because when we took that initial policy, transferred it to the actual drone in the real world, it was like, oh, you just want to idle sitting there at zero degrees per second? Fine, full throttle through the roof. So we immediately knew that we needed to reduce this control output as much as possible. And this provides the, uh, the way in order to get it so that the drone can actually idle appropriately. The last uh, bit here that we have are penalties in which the drone should never enter the state ever. And we provide, uh, what is Y right here? This Y is the actual output of the neural network, which, um, okay, uh, the actual uh, output of the neural network isn't for these type of policies between the range of negative one to one because of the activation function. In these type of um, stochastic type policies, the output is actually the mean of the distribution of a Gaussian distribution, which means it's actually unbounded. So the typical approach right now is you clip back to those bounds of the act what the activation function should be. And uh, what this penalty right here does is if you oversaturate those bounds, you get penalized based on that. Uh, some people have suggested within like OpenAI that there, there is just such an argument going on with how to actually do this. Um, 
But we found that if you do not do this, that it really likes to just be a basically like 100% uh, control output like the entire time. So this is required. Um, oh, in the pieces? Uh, that Y is in the output? Okay, I'll have to look at that again. Mm. So this is for oversaturation. The uh, next penalty is if all the control signals are one, meaning that should never happen because just should never happen. We should never be at 100% throttle for it because no angular rotation will actually occur. Um, and then the last one is basically penalizing the agent for not playing the game. So what we found is because we have the beginning and the end of zero degrees uh, per second as the set point, the drone would just be like, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just sitting here because I know if I try anything, you're going to penalize me, and I can actually accumulate more reward by doing nothing. So this basically says, fine, you don't want to play, then we're going to give you such a horrible max penalty that it's actually going to be better for you to at least try. So that's, that's what's happening here. And this, all of these penalties here really were required to um, create more stable um, training. And I believe this is mainly because of the, uh, the more accurate motor response models, because now we have this delay in the motor that actually isn't modeled often in literature. They assume that whatever control signal you apply, you immediately have that uh, power available to you, which is obviously, as we saw, not how it happens in the real world. So now that we have this temporal delay, or this de these delay characteristics, it makes it more difficult to actually learn. Oh, uh, so based on our piece of, yeah. No, no. Yes. Neither. So now the input uh, to the neural network is just the actual air and the delta air. So of the angular velocity. So think of it. Oh, the propeller. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for the clarification. So um, our uh, our thought originally doing this because we had to obviously argue why we thought this would work is essentially if uh, a neural network can model any continuous function, it should at least be able to model a fit controller, which essentially we have the derivative term and the actual error term, right? Uh, so based on our feasibility analysis, we trained um, using the PPO algorithm. We have six uh, inputs to the neural network based on our, our three for the error for each um, angular velocity, and then our three for the derivative. We have two hidden layers, 64 nodes each, and then four for each one of the um, uh, the control outputs, because we're a quadcopter, and we use 10-H activation functions. We train three, and we take the best, and we train for a total of 10 billion time steps. One thing that we actually had to change to provide more accurate policies was we actually had to disable gravity in the environment. And what this did was two things, really. <clears throat> Excuse me. It re now that we're not fighting an additional force of gravity, it allowed us to reduce the actual output of the control signals even further. And also, this allows us that no matter what angular velocity you put the actual quadcopter in, wherever everything now is just equal. Whatever force is applied, whatever orientation you're in, everything is equalized. What can happen with gravity enabled, and we need to experiment on introducing additional states, such as possibly like a quaternion for the orientation, so it knows more about where it is. But if you, for example, um, apply, because this is all happening in simulation automatically, this is hard to kind of conceptualize when you're designing these systems, but you apply an angular velocity in which it gets it into a 90 degree orientation, and it's fixed about its center of mass, and it's trying to be stuck there, then you're going to get these weird oscillations, and it's going to try to obtain a position in which in the real world is out of its flight envelope. So it just made everything a lot simpler, but in the future, we need to figure out ways we can introduce these additional uh, dynamics. Okay, so now we wanted to test the precision and accuracy of these controllers. So we did, developed a very scientific method in which we could perform this experiment. And I'm going to show that to you now. Oh, there you go. Well, uh, Neuroflight it could take on the bottle cap challenge, so I think we're done. <laughs> all right, in, uh, in all seriousness, uh, the video that I'm going to be showing you next
Um, because this really wraps up the theme of this entire project, I took uh, the video on Tuesday. I took seven uh, flight test videos, and I have to thank my wife, Kristen, because she helped me with this. Um, so the video I'm about to show you is we are now no longer in the realm of theoretical. This type of flight controller is on par, if not better, than a uh, PID flight controller. The performance capabilities that uh, I was able to observe in these flight tests, um, with this new policy, we have pretty much solved all the issues that we've had with our uh, previous policies, such as drifting in the neural network getting in weird states. We're now able to uh, essentially um, control the aircraft effortlessly, like in any type of maneuver that we actually want to. So if you've never seen um, FPV footage before, the reason why this is so horrible, it looks like you're watching HD video or uh, SD video or something, is because the um, technology of our actual um, cameras just isn't in high def yet. It's because of latency issues, and we need to have the fastest video available to us. So uh, in this uh, video, uh, basically, like on Tuesday, just testing out a variety of different like maneuvers to make sure that the aircraft is actually responding to all my commands, and uh, really just trying to stress it out to see if it gets in any like weird states that it has in like previous uh, models before. So uh, this I. I can't tell you how awesome of a feeling this was to kind of wrap everything up in this. Like, we just had a conversation two weeks ago about like, oh man, it's not coming together like it is. Yeah, no. Um, well, we're gonna look at that in the next slide. <laughs> um, okay, crash. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I crashed and then somehow it ripped off our propeller. Um, okay, so what we did is we uh, took all the recorded flight data from these seven flights and we generated these metrics on the right for different, um, uh, different metrics for air. And then what we did is we took all these set points from all these flights and we replayed them back in our simulation environment so we could see what the actual performance was in the simulation. So that means that the gap here is our reality gap or our performance gap. Now the first thing that we could see is well, there is still a gap of performance. It's still better in the simulation, which from we were kind of expecting, right? But it's only within two degrees per second. This is this is a huge improvement from our previous like policies in which it was like a gap between like 20 degrees per second or something like that. So now we're almost in the realm of like what the actual like noise would be in your actual like RC for the set points, right? Um, these different metrics mean different things. So the squared air will really like emphasize uh, uh, lower uh, versus like higher like errors. So um, for the most part, the average errors, which is the average of all the axes, are higher within the, uh, the real world, but uh, still um, quite reasonable. Now, the one thing that we still have to work on that has been a problem this entire time with this research is reducing the oscillations in the output. And no matter how, they, how good they actually are in simulation, uh, it's still um, at least twice as bad in the real world. What, now where we're at accuracy is I'm, I'm totally happy with it, it's awesome. Um, but the motors now are so hot from this context switching and oscillations that uh, not only are we at risk at melting the enamel on the actual motor, winding, motor windings, but um, from what I've also uh, been told that extremely high heat can permanently um, damage permanent magnets, which I actually didn't know. So the, in order for, um, I was basically uh, doing these flights within 60 seconds, and then the first time I was putting on my car on, the AC, like on top of the AC to cool the motors down, then I'd hop back out and do another flight test. Um, so there are still improvements that we still need to do here. And just to show you um, how bad the oscillations really are, <coughs> really are, the, um, the top graph here is the actual output from the motor control signals. And I mean, we can see here that there are crazy oscillations uh, where this is our desired and this is the actual gyro. Now, um, what uh, is most likely happening is the oscillations from the neural, net, the neural network are rapidly changing so that it can keep 
trying to track this desired state as much as possible. And I'm <clears throat> beginning to realize that uh, we need to start investigating if this has to do with gravity not being there, if it's not knowing how to fight uh, this additional force and things of that nature. So still work needs to be done here. Um, some of the impact of this research, in February we had our manuscript accepted and, and published. It currently um, has 13 citations. We have a preprint for the neural flight paper out that is going through um, uh, submissions. Our open source projects, uh, these numbers are a bit higher. We're closer to 100 stars now for uh, both of the projects. This is a fork, so don't look at that. But lots of people are using JMFC. There's a ton of activity on these two projects, and it's sparking all sorts of new research, which is really exciting. Um, something that's super cool that happened recently is the OpenAI Jim project actually lists JMFC as now a third-party environment, which is pretty sweet. Um, and uh, just to summarize, for uh, in the future, we are going, it's just such an exciting uh, period of time that we're going through with the, the new technologies, hardware just getting so much better that we could do so much more um, computation on board the actual aircraft. In the future, the possibilities of using this like fundamental neural network as a building element to see what sort of advanced control goals we can actually accomplish is just are going to be really exciting. Um, so in my thesis work, we have established an entire uh, solution stack to be able to synthesize these um, neural flight controllers and provide uh, accurate, precise flight. Uh, with this baseline that we've now achieved, there are so many different research directions that are now um, opened up, primarily in machine learning and in digital twin modeling. Uh, as we have seen, there are, are errors that we can address for creating more high fidelity models in the digital twin and so many more dynamics we can introduce into the actual environment, such as gravity, wind, we can model um, the discharge of the batteries and start to um, really create uh, more interesting uh, digital twin models here. As for machine learning, we can experiment with different neural network architectures. We can um, experiment with different activation functions, uh, different reinforcement learning algorithms. Every one, every week, there's a new reinforcement learning algorithm coming out. And this can just further increase the accuracy of our controllers. And then I think Tommy or someone mentioned something about online learning. Ultimately, what we want these control systems to be comprised of is being able to synthesize a base controller generically using these techniques. And then on board the actual aircraft, we want to provide online learning to then fill in any modeling errors from the offline simulation synthesis and also be able to, um, if we're using a generic controller as our baseline, be able to really develop the actual flight controller specific to that one aircraft to get the most optimal performance. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, Ethan. <laughs> So uh, I think what you're referring to is like a recurrent network where the output of the neural network would be fed back in, but that's... Well, is, like, so, like, so it's like you have uh, uh, you provide an input, yep. this input um, causes it to make a decision. Yep. That decision then um, changes the state of the system yep. and then has to make another decision. And each one of those decisions are dependent on the past decision. Um, so... so um, one, uh, this, I think this might, just to clarify kind of what the actual neural network is doing, it's only making its decision based on the current inputs. So there is no feedback whatsoever. But what you're referring to, I believe, is how these uh, reinforcement learning algorithms actually work is they're all modeled off of uh, uh, Markov decision processes. 
So the idea is, and the whole theory um, based on reinforcement learning, is that the state you provide the neural network is unique, such that the action that it um, makes with whatever that environment is, knowing that X state transition from the reinforcement learning algorithm, it's now gonna also know what the next action should be. So this current state basically um, gives it um, kind of its orientation of what the next transition will actually be and what action it needs to also provide. So it's able to kind of, um, years ago when these recurrent neural networks were um, being worked on much more, they were trying to get kind of the same behavior that these reinforcement learning algorithms are able to do now without that, if that makes sense. Yeah. If, yeah, if you kind of just think of um, all of the, the states here, there's going to be a probability of jumping to the next state for a given action. So the neural network is trained to know given particular action. I don't think you can see more than one. Yeah. Yeah, that was our, our very beginning when I, we showed the feasibility analysis. We do that. We look at um, M number of past actions that we've taken, or past states, not actions. What was the history of states that we uh, took? And then we provided that, all of those as input to see if it would help, and it doesn't. Because still, it's by the uh, Markov decision process. As long as our state can uniquely identify whatever state we're ever going to be in, then that's sufficient enough. <clears throat> and you don't need. It's memory. It's right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, there, yeah, there are so many different avenues of providing different mechanisms. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Well. Do you think there's any limitations like while you're flying around or missing neural networks or something like that? Or is it just simple to visualize? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm gonna say there's most likely. I I didn't think that it would happen in the last policy, and then it would get into these weird states where, in certain conditions, if you applied enough. Um, throttle that thing would flip over and it was really scary and I was like I don't want to apply this anymore it's not fun um, so I want to say that from these videos in my experience it seems that it's not getting any weird states but I don't know which brings us to the next question is for these to be adopted we need so much more research on how to validate these type of controllers um, recent uh, work in NASA has actually tested neural network control in F-18s and the amount of work they had to do to get this approved in NASA to be able to put this type of control system on was like crazy. They wrote like a whole paper on it. And that was just within NASA. And they also discussed on uh, how much more difficult it is going to be for these to be adopted in any sort of commercial use. So policy-wise, we still have all these challenges ahead of us. Yeah, Tommy. Yeah, we can measure 
So, um, yeah, uh, so for future, uh, future work, we want to be able to try all different environments. Um, open, or sorry, Gazebo already supports a lot of stuff out of the box, such as wind and like air density and things like that. Um, but more complicated dynamics, such as we want to model, um, model like battery discharge or something, that's all going to have to be custom. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is uh, being looked at by uh, lots of groups right now, and it's called domain randomization. So what you do is you essentially randomize the environments um, significantly during training. Um, the theory is then when you actually transfer it to the real world, the real world just looks like this new variation, right? So a uh, recent paper, actually, I've been talking with the authors, have applied domain ram randomization to quadcopters, and they did exactly that. So they studied, all right, can we use domain randomization, change all these different properties, and how well do they then transfer to, I think they tested three different type of uh, quadcopters. Um, I think this is definitely the direction to go for creating generic controllers. But based on their results and just how domain randomization works, is you still need online learning because you'll ha you'll create more of gen uh, generic quadcopters. And I really believe the only like for a baseline, all we need really is to get to the point where these controllers generically are able to create um, stable flight. Doesn't have to be good; it can even oscillate. But as soon as it's in the air and it could be there safely, once online learning kicks in, then We'll have to do more research, but hopefully then it'll start to adapt to the actual individual aircraft and start to optimize performance for that. Yeah. It's just in the real world. Yeah, and in, in simulation it looks beautiful, <laughs> which is uh, what's driving me a little crazy. Uh, um, it, it also. One of the challenges with reinforcement learning, too, is always how to balance the rewards. Um, this is also being looked at. This is just such like a new field. Um, in our pri prior policies, the accuracy wasn't that great, but there wasn't any, os <coughs> there wasn't any oscillations. So uh, how to find um, kind of the balance between the two is, is still kind of a challenge. You want high oscillations with incredible accuracy, or do you want bad accuracy? So we need a middle ground. Yeah, Rob. Why do the oscillations matter? What, what, what's the, the line from constant Yeah, I've been thinking about this all week, actually. It's like, well, if I can't visibly see the, uh, see the oscillations, they're not affected, they're actually causing better performance. Why is this even a big deal? So uh, what I would like to experiment in the future is we need to identify what the good oscillations are and to be able to somehow work in new states so the aircraft knows its, um, uh, its, its actual current capabilities. So looking at like the actual flight uh, envelopes that I was talking about in the beginning so that it, can, it knows what is the dangerous point and dangerous temperatures of that motor and make sure that it's, not, it's oscillating below any point that can cause damage, permanent damage to the motors. So I think that's going to be the key moving forward. Yeah, Sid. Yeah. Is it affected by um, the ghost transportation? How we're sampling the set point? Uh, in Yeah, um, I, I've only started to experiment with this a little bit, and the reason for going for the Gaussian distribution was because I started to notice that when you're kind of training on a wider flight envelope, that it, it wasn't going to be um, quite as accurate through that entire range. Um, I think that with ex uh, expanding the size of the neural network, we might be able to increase the flight envelope further. But uh, using a Gaussian distribution, we were able to get more accurate um, performance in the 
set points that were most used by the actual pilot. Did that answer? My question was more like, so you, the distribution that we have right now. Yeah, the Gaussian one. In your network actually experience. In the real world? In training. Uh-huh. Yeah, this is a this is a great question. I really like um, kind of where this direction is going to with uh, flight envelopes, and um, I've been thinking about this a lot more because ultimately, what we want to do in training is uh, learn the flight envelope as we're doing it. So. Uh, Right now, if we're just like, oh yeah, we're throwing these random like ranges, like, is it even feasible to reach these? So uh, we experimented a little bit with starting with small ranges and then uh, kind of doing incremental learning to see uh, if it could remain stable. And then we increase it further and further. Um, this just requires such a significant amount of computational like power to be able to do this. I don't have an answer for you right now, but I think at least moving forward we want to uh, discover the envelope at the same time that we're actually doing this training. Whether that corresponds to the real world of that same flight envelope, that's another question, I think. Yeah, no. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so I, I think the end goal is to provide like full state um, input. So um, NASA has this huge like idea of um, the self-aware aircraft of the future in which it is a like kind of everything I've been um, looking at for the future of this flight control has really um, been pushed by what NASA has already been thinking about and doing. And they want to accomplish like similar goals where if you're able to identify the entire state of the aircraft, then you're going to be able to make the best decisions possible, whether it's low-level control or high-level control. Uh, I've experimented with this a little bit of including all the accelerometer turning and orientation. And um, what I found when it comes down to just accuracy of angular velocity, it actually made the performance worse. So I think this is going to take more uh, research into um, increasing and experimenting with different neural network architectures to make sure that we have the right infrastructure to support the uh, addition and the larger size of the actual input space to still have the same level of accuracy. Right. Um, I I kind of kind of want the general goal though to be just one neural network though. Like I know it might not be the most um, practical from a design point design standpoint, but uh, if we're talking about these like hierarchical architectures though, we we might want to have one neural network that is able to perform this particular goal of accuracy very well, but then there might be another neural network that we can have this composability type framework in which this is also going to provide these higher advanced goals, such as being able to uh, plan for failures and then um, act accordingly. So um, there's no question about having to expand the neural network architecture to support these additional goals. It's just Yeah, they're like, right, 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 exactly. Okay.